take our Bibles for a couple minutes and we're going to go to uh, 1 Peter and chapter number 1. And in 10 to 15 minutes, I'm going to clarify the whole debate that's been going on for hundreds and hundreds of years about the security of the believer. Am I good or what? We're in First Peter in chapter number one. Wait till I get there. Uh, we are going to save a couple minutes and we're going to read uh, just uh, verses three through five. Once you found that, let's stand out of respect to God's word. First Peter chapter one, verse three. Blessed be the God and Father of our Lord Jesus Christ, which according to his abundant mercy hath begotten, the thought is being born again. You'll see that over in verse 23 also. This is a theme of this chapter. There he says being born not of corruptible seed, but incorruptible by the word of God. So the word of God is connected with the rebirth that happens when we believe in Jesus as our Savior. And then you go to John chapter 3, and he describes it there that as, as Jesus explained the new birth process, it is by believing that God loved the world that he gave his only begotten son. Whoever believes in him won't perish but have everlasting life. Then here he connects a new birth with the resurrection, begotten us again unto a lively or living hope by the resurrection of Jesus Christ from the dead. So we have the death, the resurrection, the word of God, the love of God is all connected with the new birth process. How much of that have you personally done, according to these verses, what have you personally done to receive that new birth? The answer is one thing, belief, faith. All through the thread is by belief. Verse number four, to an inheritance incorruptible, undefiled, and that fadeth not away. Now notice, it is reserved in heaven for you. So something is yet futuristic to give us a fulfillment, fulfillment of the inheritance, something that God is going to be giving us. Verse number five, who? That will be the believer. Those who are born again are kept by the power of God through faith unto salvation, ready to be revealed in the last time. Lord, bless the time. Use it for your glory. And we'll thank you for what you'll do. Holy Spirit, please do the job of teaching today. And it is in your name we pray. Amen. You may be seated. Why is the security of the believer so important? And that's why connecting the dots must begin with understanding our salvation and what we have in Christ. Without having a security, or in other words, without knowing that we are saved, everything else that we're going to be talking about this year is going to literally be meaningless. I say that because years ago I got a call, um, this young man who is about 12 years old, was finally sat down with his parents, and the parents explained to him that he was adopted. Why they waited to until he was 12 years old, I am not sure, but that was the parents' choice, to wait till they felt that he could understand it. As soon as he found out that he was adopted, he fled, literally into the ridge in Pennsylvania. They called me up and said, please, Carl, will you go and see him? And I did. I finally found him sitting and bawling his head off on a big rock, and I sat beside him, and I said... It's hard, isn't it? He is. I didn't know. I didn't understand. I don't really have parents. They lied to me all these years. He felt betrayed, and he felt he didn't have anybody. The brothers weren't brothers. Parents weren't parents. He felt all alone. Was there any security in this young man's heart? None. Did he felt he belonged to a family? No. Did he feel like he could then talk to his parents and talk to his father because his father loved them and was going to take care of him. No, he lost all security, and it affected everything inside of him. Where do I go from here? Who am I going to be with? Everything. So I sat down and explained to him something, and I said, you don't know this, but I'm also adopted. He looked at me, he's like, you are? I said, yeah. God adopted me. And I said, do you understand what your parents did was out of love? Just as my heavenly father created in me by a new birth and adoption. 
And this adoption is not finalized yet. You get into Galatians 4, and you get under portions of Scripture, uh, Romans deals with it, where he tells us that when we were first physically born, we weren't immediately into God's family. We were born into the devil's family. We were born sinners. We weren't born saints. By the way, do you know how many people said, I've always been saved. I've been saved when I was, since I've been born. I'm like, where did you learn that one? Because that's not what the Bible says. In Adam, all die. So, there there's, needs to be a transition. And so God says that he sent his son into our hearts. And, and it, it's like we cry, Abba, Father. And it's because we are now uh, born again or placed through adoption into God's family. And he started to lighten up. He started to realize, oh, I'm starting to get this. Just because we weren't born into God's family, we were born into the devil's, God loves us and put us into his family out of love. And I said, that's why your parents loved you. They are your parents. And one day you're going to be in their will. And you as a son, just like all of the others, you are going to receive an inheritance one day. Folks, that's what's going to happen to us. That's the thought of the future. In Christ, the fullness of the inheritance that you and I will have as Christians won't be seen until we finally get into heaven. Finally rewarded. Finally the marriage feast. Finally for all of eternity, we see why we're here in the first place. There has to be a security of a relationship with God or there's nothing else. You can't say, I have fears, God's going to take them away if you don't even know God loves you. How can you have fear of death dissipating from your life and you no longer worry about that if you don't even know of salvation that Christ is in you and you're going to heaven? You have no hope. You have nothing to look forward to. This is the groundwork. This is a wall that we're building this year and it starts out with this incredible foundational rock that is built upon Jesus Christ, the foundation. And if we don't know we're saved, how can you witness to anybody about Jesus saves? If you don't know Jesus saves, if you have no idea if you're going to heaven, why would you even talk to somebody about Jesus? Let's talk to them about politics. Let's talk to them about social structures. Let's talk about family. Let's talk about food. We love that one. But when we know Christ is Savior, it's a relationship. Just as I could talk to you about Frank and Francis. You say, who are they? Mom and dad. I could tell you all kinds of stories about them because I had a relationship with them. The same thing with my Heavenly Father. I could tell you story after story about how much God loves me and what he's done in my life. It's a relationship. It's because I believe in him. How can we have confidence? How can fears go away? How can I not be overwhelmed with life? How can I get out of guilt? How can I ever even find purpose in life if I do not know that I am saved? But God says, these things have I written unto you that believe, that you may know that you have eternal life. Why did God want us to say, when I put my head in a pillow, that I know if I were to die through the night of a massive heart attack, I'm going to be in heaven. Why is that important to God for me to know? Because God made us and he knows our social structure. And he knows that we need that uh, confidence, that understanding, that knowledge. When I tuck my kids into bed at night, we pray together. And one thing that I would always say to them is, I love you. Why did I have to say it over and over again? Because my little ones needed that. They needed that confidence. They needed to know what was a relationship. And it wasn't just one way. It was both ways. Because then they'd say, love you too. Love those grandkids when they come over. And I'm saying, I love you. They need to know Grandpa loves them. It's a relationship. And that's what God does for us. So that last week, we were able to bring some concepts up. And today, we see in verse number 5, those who are believers are kept by the power of God. That word kept there means to literally guard. It comes from a military term that a guard is protecting from any enemy that is out there. Follow me quickly. God is our guard. 
He is protecting us from the devil. He's protecting us from uh, uh, testings and temptations. Everything that could be coming at us, God says, I have you guarded, surrounded. No one is going to be able to touch you. We learned last week in the book of Ephesians that when we trusted Jesus Christ as our Savior, we were sealed by the Holy Spirit of promise. There again, something futuristic. It was only a down payment of the Spirit of God to us. We will one day understand all the benefits that we have in God. You'll have to refer to last week's message for the rest of that. So the word sealing is that God literally almost is an as we would imagine it, an envelope that as the kings would put his insignia on this piece of wax and seal a letter, give it then to the page, that they would be able to take it to the destination. No one could open up that letter until it arrived at its destination. If that letter was opened up, that person would know it because no one else could seal that letter except for the king. The thought is, God sealed you until you die and go to heaven, or Jesus returns. I thought it would be like shouting ground right there. I'm almost done, folks, okay? (laughs) So we're guarded by God, we're sealed by God, and then if you go to John chapter number 10, there God says, I have taken you and I have placed you two sets of hands, two hands. One, he says, I've set you in the Father's hand. And then the same text, he says, you're in Jesus' hand. I like that. So it's as though God's hands, the Father and the Son, are all around you. And you are kept by God. He knows you. You. Your name. Who you are. The moment you said yes to Jesus Christ, you were placed into the hands of God. And then you see that we are sealed by the Spirit of God. Father's hand, Son's hand, sealed by the Spirit. The only way that I can lose my salvation, if you could find a way of going to heaven, have fun with that one, get through the mighty angels, go through the power of God, and exist to get into the holiness of God's presence and destroy God. If you can destroy God... You can then take my salvation, because that's where I'm at, according to the Scriptures. Now, some have said, oh, yeah, but you can take yourself out of the hands of God. I've had a couple people say that. They think you lose your salvation. That's the big debate over the last centuries, you know. It's like, oh, you can lose it. Okay, i got a couple questions for you. I want you to analyze the word. Anywhere in that text did it say anybody was able to take you out of God's hand? No. No man can Pluck you out of God's hand, right? Got that one down. They say, well, I'm going to remove myself from God's hand. Are you stupid? Well, sorry, I'm trying to, trying to get your reasoning. Why would you intentionally remove yourself from the Father's hand, the Son's hand, and the sealing of the Spirit of God? Why would you intentionally pull yourself out? See, that text is helping you to understand apostasy or the going, departing from the faith is not done by true believers. If a person says, well, I just don't believe in God and I'm just going to live my life and nothing's ever going to happen to me and nothing does, then what you're basically showing is you are never a believer in the first place. You were never truly born again. So you departed from the faith. Told you, 10, 15 minutes. I'm going to have it all nailed down. You good? So we are in God's hand. We're sealed by the Spirit of God. We are guarded by God. You have a brand new birth, John chapter number 3, also being born again, verse number 23. And never does it say you can be unborn. Could you physically be unborn as though you never exist? Happens in movies and happens in comics. This is your life. You know, you never were born. You never existed. Well, that's not a reality, folks. You are here. You are born. And when you are born again, you are given eternal life that you are an eternal being. You will be forever. John 5, 26, or 24, you know, that's my life verse. Verily, verily, I say unto you, he that hears my word, 
believes on him that has sent me, has everlasting life and shall not come into condemnation, but is passed from death unto life. Yeah. New birth. Then the last part is, is uh, the fact of eternal life. Eternal life. Okay, I got a question. If God gives you eternal life, how could it not be eternal? I'm not trying to be, you know, unkind here, but if God promised to give you, if you believed in Jesus Christ, eternal life, and then he says, I'm not going to any longer give you eternal life and take it away from you, it was never eternal in the first place then. It's either eternal or it's temporary. And God never uses the word temporary. Salvation is temporary. Eternal life. God says, I am not going to lie about that in Titus 1-2. There's a promise to God for before the foundation of the world, I'm going to give those who believe eternal life, and God says, I'm not lying about this one. We're not going to get up to heaven, and God's going to say, you know what, folks? I know I said that in my Bible. I changed my mind. I changed the whole plan of salvation. It's not eternal. Sorry, you're going to hell. Oh, you didn't do enough good works, or you messed up right before you died, and a bad word came out of your mouth to the nurse right when you were about to die, so bam, you're going to hell now. I don't know what God would do that, but it's not the God of the Bible. We're almost done. So, number one, believe the message of God. Believe what God says. Connect your life and its security to the word of God. How is it possible, though, for a great sinner like Paul, like like Peter, to have verses like this, knowing that they were going to heaven? Paul murdered Christians, and yet he knew who he was believing in, where he was going to heaven. Peter denied Jesus three times. He was with him. He looks at Peter and says, get thee behind me, Satan. I mean, he's saying falsehoods. He's trying to bring testing to Jesus. It's like, who are you, Peter? And he says, well, I'm born again, going to heaven, got an inheritance in heaven, going there. How could you have confidence? Peter, you're a loser. You're a loser of a believer. I've never denied the Lord, we think. I would never curse just to give another way of talking to not be associated with being a Christian. Peter did. God is able to save the vilest of sinners and set them free. This is what God does. I am either forgiven by grace, mercy, and love, or I have been lied to by God, and I cannot know I'm going to heaven because I am unworthy to go on my own merit. It's either God or it's me, and it can't be both. I got good friends and they have good intentions. I love them, I love them, I love them. But they have been taught all of their life works in Jesus, works in Jesus. And usually it's in that order. Yep, Jesus is this cute little thing that helps me along, but I've got to keep it. There is no verse associated with with salvation that I have come up with that says you keep it. I read Galatians chapter 3, and i got to close with this one. Galatians chapter 3, and I could go on two hours on this one. Okay, you know that, verse after verse. He looks at this church, and he says, okay, so you've been learning about the law, have you? And do's and don'ts about the Old Testament laws. And he says, so basically, now that you... Learn first about Jesus, and he died for your sins, etc. And now these people are coming into the church and saying, and by the way, you better make sure you're keeping the Sabbath, and you're doing the dietary laws, and you're going through the ceremonial washings, and you're keeping the feast and the Passover, and you're doing all these things. Because if you don't, you're going to die and go to hell. If you don't do this, Paul comes in and says, okay, to this whole region. It's not just one church, the whole region of Galatia. This is what was scattering through this area. So Paul nails it. He says, you're a bunch of fools. He calls the church a bunch of fools. 
Oh, foolish Galatians, who has bewitched you? Who's deceived you? Who cunningly have come in and they are bringing you back under this horrific law that neither they keep, none of, none of the Old Testament saints even kept it, and now you're going to keep it because you're great? He says, who has bewitched you? Having begun in the Spirit... I'm going to give you the tense of this. Are you now continually making yourself perfect? He says, you are a fool if you think you're keeping yourself saved. Because you can't do it on your own merit. I am guarded by God. I am sealed by God. I am in the Father's hand, the Son's hand. The God, the God does not lie about eternal life. He gave me eternal life. I didn't earn it. I can't merit it. I can't do anything. That's why God is praised in my life and not myself. God is glorified because he saved me. That's what it's about. He receives honor. But when we change our life and I keep the law, it's like, oh, God, you, boy, are you lucky to have me on your side. Boy, you're lucky to have me in heaven, man. I'm going to straighten everything out when I get there. I am so holy and I am so good. God is like, uh, your righteousness is a bunch of filthy rags. We are nothing but dirt put together. God breathed into our nostrils a breath of life. We're a bunch of sinners that have been saved by grace. Lord, we love you. We thank you. Give it to them. And we'll thank you for Jesus' sake. Amen. Let's stand together. Maybe you're struggling, maybe your prayer life, maybe your confidence in God is totally weak because you don't even know if you're saved. You don't know if you've been forgiven. God wants to take care of that through his word. Connect the word to those feelings and emotions, those things that maybe you've always been taught, and allow God to transform your life by allowing his word to permeate your life and to give you confidence, not in yourself, with confidence in God, what he has done for you.